Welcome to Deconstructing, where I take apart an iconic horror movie to find out what makes it tick. In this episode, we're entering the nightmare netherworld of Italian horror legend Dario Argento. Even Argento's most passionate fans consider 1977's Suspiria to be his greatest achievement. Those same fans were outraged at the idea of a remake, but many of them came around when the 2018 version hit theaters, revealing director Luca Guadagnino's own distinctive point of view. But I'm not going to be comparing the two versions here because that's not what this series is about. Instead, I'm going to break down the original Suspiria into three categories. Origin, in which we explore its mythical, historical, and literary influences. Legacy, where we examine Suspiria's lasting impact on horror cinema. And Mystery, an overview of some interesting fan theories addressing the story's big unknowns. I'll even drop a few trivia bombs along the way just to make sure you're paying attention. So turn out the lights, grab something sharp, and tell yourself it's only a dream, because we're about to deconstruct Dario Argento's Suspiria. Film scholars often refer to Suspiria as a cinematic folktale, and that difference marks a turning point in Argento's filmography. The success of the 1970 thriller The Bird with the Crystal Plumage established Argento as one of the preeminent filmmakers in the uniquely Italian genre known as giallo. Italian for yellow, giallo takes its name from the yellow spines of paperback mysteries and pulp crime novels. The Bird with the Crystal Plumage is still considered one of the greatest giallo films of all time, thanks to Argento's signature style, including some unique and shocking ways of depicting murder on camera. He followed that film's success with two more murder mysteries bearing similar styles and titles, but it was 1975's Deep Red which marked a radical shift in storytelling for Argento. While he'd built his reputation on murder mysteries and thrillers, Deep Red pushed Argento's writing into the realm of the supernatural. It also marked Argento's first collaboration with Italian progressive rock band Cherry Five, who recorded the film's music under a different name, Goblin. These elements combined to form the foundation of Argento's next project, which mostly broke free from the Giallo rulebook. According to Argento himself, the idea for Suspiria originated while he was traveling Europe, during which he became fascinated with the so-called Magic Triangle, where the borders of Germany, France, and Switzerland meet. Further research led him to the occult writings of Rudolf Steiner, an Austrian scholar who believed the mysteries of the supernatural could be explained through scientific study. It also drew him deeper into the writings of esteemed British author and poet Thomas de Quincey, particularly the poem Suspiria de Profundis and the passage Lavana and Our Ladies of Sorrow. De Quincey's poem describes the nature of sorrow as represented by three mothers, Mater Lacrimarum, Our Lady of Tears, Mater Suspiriorum, Our Lady of Sighs, and Mater Tenebrarum, Our Lady of Darkness. Argento's partner and Suspiria co-writer, Daria Nicolati, was intrigued by this alternate mythology, which she likened to the fairy tales that frightened and fascinated her as a child. Nicolati also claimed to recall a story told by her grandmother, Yvonne Mueller Loeb, who claimed to have encountered a coven of witches while studying at a prestigious music academy. Argento was denied the origin of this story, but it nevertheless became a central component of the screenplay. All of these ideas intersected at the perfect location, the Magic Triangle. Nicolati's fictional dance academy was placed in the city of Freiburg, near the borders of Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Originally, they intended to cast pre-teen actresses to play the dance students, but the producers balked at this idea, fearing worldwide audiences would be disturbed to see such young characters murdered in horrific ways. Argento and Nicolati relented, and they cast actors in their teens and 20s, but they never changed the script. I once read that names which begin with the letter S are the names of snakes. The childlike dialogue infantilized the main characters, and Argento cast actresses with slender physiques and large eyes to make them even more childlike. The art director and set designer also moved the doorknobs and ceilings higher to make the girls appear smaller on camera. The next step was finding the right look for a modern day fairy tale. Argento turned to cinematographer Luciano Tovoli, who put the emphasis on bold primary colors, inspired by the exaggerated palette of Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. 
In addition to the heightened lighting scheme, Argento and Tavoli hired one of the world's few remaining three-strip Technicolor labs to process the print, enhancing elements of pure red, blue, and yellow until the images became almost cartoonish. Combined with Goblin's otherworldly score, the look and feel of Suspiria transported the story into the realm of pure fantasy, where the rules of everyday reality no longer apply, allowing the director to ditch the whodunit logic of his earlier thrillers. But Suspiria hangs on to one of the most memorable elements of the giallo, and that is creative and shocking death scenes. Suspiria would surpass Deep Red and The Bird with the Crystal Plumage to become Argento's most popular film to date. 20th Century Fox acquired it for U.S. distribution, but they feared American audiences weren't ready for the film's graphic violence, so they cut eight minutes of gory footage and released it through the shell company International Classics. Nevertheless, American audiences packed theaters to see the Italian Shocker, which became one of the top box office hits of 1977, and to put that in perspective, that's the same year Fox released Star Wars. This nightmarish ad for the U.S. release may have helped attract audiences looking for the biggest screen scares since The Exorcist. Roses are red, violets are blue, but the iris is the flower. That will mean the end of you! Over the years, Suspiria not only became a cult classic, it's also considered one of the most influential and visionary films ever made. Naturally, Suspiria fans were up in arms when rumors of a remake began to circulate in the late 2000s, possibly with David Gordon Green at the helm long before the same filmmaker would successfully revive the Halloween franchise. At one point, Natalie Portman, who won worldwide acclaim for her performance in Black Swan, itself partly inspired by Suspiria, wanted to produce a remake with herself in the lead, but that was also put on hold. Nothing came to pass until Oscar nominee Luca Guadagnino announced his intent to create a personal homage to Argento's film, rather than a true remake. Fans still resisted the new version at first, but it eventually grew a large fan base of its own. Since then, many fans of the original film consider it a worthy tribute to Argento's legacy and one of the most significant female-centric horror films of the 21st century. As with any film that discards traditional narrative, Suspiria has spawned fan theories concerning its unexplained plot points. Here are some of the most interesting interpretations. Unlike Argento's Giallo films, Suspiria does not reveal the person or persons dishing out deaths. During the notorious opening double murder, we get a glimpse of yellow cat eyes and a hairy hand with long black fingernails, traits which would be pretty easy to pick out of a lineup. The most likely suspect is the huge mute Pavlos, who can be seen coveting Sarah's cigarette lighter with its embedded clock. But when we get a look at Pavlos' hands, they seem relatively normal. Some viewers theorize the killer is mother witch Helena Marcos, whom we see as a shriveled, wheezing, diseased crone. A more fitting theory holds that the culprit is a demon conjured by Marcos, which may hide in human form until she commands it to kill. This is supported by the reanimation of Sarah, whom we saw murdered in a pit of barbed wire before she rises again to attack Susie. It would seem Marcos can animate any living or dead person to carry out her bidding, and that could include other students or faculty members, or even a seeing eye dog. One of many unexplained aspects of Suspiria is Susie Banyan's sudden dizzy spell, which begins after a reflection on the cook's knife partially blinds her. Has the cook placed a curse on her? If so, why? If the coven is trying to eliminate witnesses to the previous murders, why didn't they finish her off right there and then? When Susie defies doctor's orders and disposes of her meal, the liquid in her wine glass looks very much like blood, hinting she's been selected for a ritual of some kind. But near the end of the film, the Academy's headmistress, Madame Blanc, can be heard ordering the death of the American girl. Why didn't they kill her earlier if she's such a threat? Maybe they don't have the power to do that. That idea ties into another theory, that Susie possesses supernatural powers of her own, which ultimately bring about the destruction of the coven. 
Susie may not even know she has this power, but instead could be an unwitting pawn in a plot to kill Marcos. This concept is explored in the 2018 film, in which Susie is indeed fated to bring down the current incarnation of Helena Marcos and ascend to the leadership of the coven. When it comes to Argento's masterpiece, your interpretation is as valid as anyone else's, and thanks to its otherworldly appeal, we can continue to let our imaginations run wild in the dream world that Argento created. What are your thoughts on our deconstruction of Suspiria? Be sure to comment, share, and subscribe to see more videos like this one. And let us know what horror classic you want to see deconstructed next. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Stop it!